Thank you for checking out 90forchill.com, the podcast. This is your host, Cat Bus Russ, and if you've been listening on the Podbean feed for the past three years, thank you very much for your patronage. I'm just going to say Podbean's a great service uh, for those intense podcast editors like you know, myself, I have a multimedia background, at least from college. So I loved kind of the tools. It's just a very pricey platform and there are better options, at least more affordable options. So 90 for chill, the podcast, I'm sorry, 90 for chill.com. The podcast has changed to 90 for chill, the podcast with cat bus Russ. It can still be found on 90 for chill.com if you want your google nest or amazon echo device to find the podcast ask your device to play podcast by cat bus russ and that should get you here this feed's going to stay up for at least the next year podbean does offer an affordable archiving system something to consider if you want to get on this platform all i can really say is that i'm not wasn't a fan of how tricky it can be to get it set up i mean i'm as i say i have a background in it so it wasn't too hard once i started putting the clues together but it's not very intuitive they've uh, been very good to me besides for sending me ben shapiro ads i can't say that they are a bad platform to be on. More affordable would definitely be Spotify for podcasters, and that's where you will find 90 for Chill, the podcast with Cat Bus Russ, and that's where all the new content will be. I'm just going to finish up the remainder of the paid period with some new episodes here, but otherwise, look for 90 for Chill, the podcast with Cat Bus Russ at 90forchill.com. Thank you. <laughs> We have had a doozy of a day. A real doozy. This podcast is protected under the laws of the United States and other countries. Unauthorized duplication, distribution, or exhibition may result in civil liability, criminal prosecution, and the wrath of the tall man. Little hands says it's time to rock and roll. Bring the noise. Happy New Year and welcome to 90 for Chill the Podcast with Cat Bus Russ. This is your host, Cat Bus Russ. And if you want to get an idea of what could be coming up on the podcast, you can follow my letterbox. The username there is CM Darth. That's C as in cool, M as in movies, Darth as in a Sith Lord. This week, well, you know. How did I expect to get a guest when we have all the holiday festivities and the New Year's festivities? You know, everybody's getting a reset, so I decided to just go and take this episode on my own. And with a common theme on this podcast, I decided, well, I'll just shape up a marathon to do so. So it's not going to be competing against anybody like I have with Andrew TD when we did our how to get the tombstone podcast or our how to get to the thing 1982 of course a lot of kurt russell love between andrew and i uh, or the exorcist uh, podcast with uh, jonathan romeo of a film worth fighting for you can still find him on most social media at a mind on fire so I also kind of got encouraged by the concept of doing a marathon because I really got to get rid of my Chris Jericho files, I suppose, after what came out on December 30th, or at least what allegedly came out. I'm not going to doubt the validity of a MAGA rock star, but I digress there. So, you know... I'm not going to say that movie I was going to throw in there is worth being on the marathon, so I'll just throw that at the end of the podcast. Otherwise, it was just fun trying to figure out how I would do a B-movie action festival. So we're going to explore the world of Black Mask, the Sui Hark uh, franchise. Let's not hinder Jet Li with that. And I'll talk about one of my favorite Dolph Lundgren movies. And as mentioned back on a podcast with Tim Bates, that episode, I believe, was about Arena from 1989. It's not going to be Arena, but I did mention that I had gotten a hold of a copy of Stone Cold, the Brian Bosworth action movie with 
him going up against Lance Henriksen. I think it's a lot of fun. So, yeah, I'll just play my marathon appropriately, and I'd love to get some feedback on how it's going to conclude. So just imagine it like this. First movie is a 6 o'clock. Second movie is an 8 o'clock. Third movie is a 10 o'clock. And then you got your midnight show. So hope you enjoy the format this week. If you want to fill in that guest void that I currently have, I'm looking to have a guest for my next uh for the next live episode, I would say would be the and it's kind of tough. My dad got me a British uh Newcastle United calendar that I'm trying to look at and they put everything in such small print. So, if today is the 10th, so the 24th is when I'd like to get my first guest on the podcast this year. And I'd be honored if you'd like to fulfill that role. You can do so by sending an email to rustthebus07 at gmail.com. That's R-U-S-S-T-H-E-B-U-S-0-7 at gmail.com. And offer me a movie, a director, a theme, an actor. Try to focus on sub-100 minute material, but as my podcast with... Andrew and John states, I can work with anything as long as you're willing to put in a little extra effort. So, uh, otherwise, follow me on my social medias. It's at CatBusRuss on Twitter. But I really like you to all join the migration to Mastodon. My username there is at RussStevens at Mastodon.social. It's not as tedious as it seems, believe me, once you get on the platform. Otherwise, all I really got to do is uh, thank Stacia Harden for uh, looking after me and Ava, the Queen Kitty. Um, I'm hoping I'm doing you proud, and I hope you are doing the same for everybody you touched in your life. And I hope you're squeezing the ever-loving, or I guess, ever. well, it is ever-loving, but, um, well, just the undead dead guts out of little skimble shanks the one-eared angel so thanks for checking out 90 for chill the podcast hope you enjoy the show and let me know what you think about this marathon now available on video cassette news update another mass execution left 100 men dead a population held captive by the darkest of evil. Now, the world's last hope is a hero no one has ever seen. identity and the world a new hero lethal weapon force jet lee is black mask and i've just gotten around to a rewatch of black mask from 1996 starring jet lee Released in the States, I believe, in 99, right after Lethal Weapon 4 to capitalize on the actor's popularity and also probably play on the fact that, oh, it's it's Ping Yuen's fight choreography and he just made it big with The Matrix. It's uh, from Artisan Entertainment, or at least this version I watched and only in dubbed. It just kind of, you can tell this is just a cash grab. I mean, this had to be from the late 90s as in 99, 2000, just because of the soundtrack pretty much being all hip hop everlast is on it. And we know he didn't really break big until about 99 on his own, but I digress. It's fun in a lot of ways, but it's definitely just very much like, let's get this, make this look as cool as possible without really thinking, but does it look good? There's so many cuts in the editing and set pieces that don't really make sense, and boy, did they really try with the CG explosions. Like, this is 1996, not uh, just obviously bad-looking, out-of-place kind of stuff. Hey, at least they've got stuntmen on fire. But 
not really enough to justify the visual mess of it. The wet environments in warehouses, dusty, what have you, kind of reminded me of Highlander 2, The Quickening. That's not really a great thing to get compared to. As I say, they were just trying to make something look cool. It's a story about Jet Li as a super soldier who's acclimated himself to the real world as a librarian after successfully allowing the rest of his squad to escape the military extermination plan for them. Too bad that escape kind of meant they are a little pissed and want their vengeance. So it's up to Jet Li to save all the innocent people from a new crime syndicate that will be formed. The action, with all those cuts, it just doesn't look great. I mean, this is the guy, Jet Li, who's my favorite movie of his is Master of Tai Chi. I think it was Twin Warriors on its originally release on American DVD. I think it was from Dimension. I have the Dragon Dynasty version myself. Fun dub, just a lot of anime voice actors I caught. It really allowed you to see the beauty of Jet Li's martial arts prowess. This one, not so much. As I say, just way too many cuts, way too many set pieces, and like, oh, it's going to look cool if we use lasers here, and it's like, yeah, no. Like, how do we just get to lasers? Like, nothing is really thought out and placed correctly in this feature. I'm not saying it isn't fun. As I say, I liked Highlander The Quickening, and I know that's not a good movie. This is just a simple cash grab, and I know it has a sequel, which I plan to get around to perhaps the immediate day after I finish this. I don't want to give all the dates away. That one has Rob Van Dam in it primarily is the reason I want to check it out. And I guess he's heavily made up. And I guess it's a horrible movie. We'll find out, though. You just really want a movie like this to be good. Or you just really wish they would have chosen another movie to of Jet Li's past to... Well, it's it's tough. It's just basically like Jet Li has had quite the filmography to this point. Was Black Mask just the cheapest one to get that the Weinsteins didn't have the rights to? Hello there. Pardon the interruption, but this is where I state that Black Mask is not going to be part of the official marathon that I'm suggesting. One, you can't really get it on digital, so you can't do it at home. And two... The sequel is far crazier and definitely would be more of a ball to watch in a theater. But before we get to that, I think we need to put on a good movie to get us all in a strong mood for what is to come. Some people want to talk to you. Ah! Nicholas Gunner, we're in the market for someone with your special talents. I don't do that anymore. It's in our blood, Nick. You can't do anything else because your heart isn't in it. In this ocean. We're hitting a tiny island at the edge of the South China Sea. On this island. We go in, lean on the locals, and convince them to sign the contract. People live a life of peace. What caused the people you want me to shoot at, man? Lighter than you, but darker than me. Until an army of mercenaries. We can make you a very rich man. Came to invade their world. Nobody signed paper once. You don't get it, do you? How much money they pay you to burn our island. Well, if we don't do it, they'll just send somebody else. Nick Gunner is a soldier who's hired to wage wars. We're prepared to do a job! Let's do it, man! But in the soul of a people... Your move, boss. Put the gun down, please. He has discovered something worth fighting for. As of now, take control of this island. If you want to stay, stay. If not, your pay is on the ship. Well, I'm the only one they want dead. We're in it all the way. You know, I envy you. You're gonna die for something you believe in. Welcome to hell. Based on the original screenplay by Academy Award nominee John Sayles, Dolph Lundgren, Charlotte Lewis. You want a gunfight? Men of War. And yet another fun rewatch of the Dolph Lundgren 1994 feature, Men of War, an early, I believe an early Dimensions film release, 
at least stateside. It features the likes of, oh shoot, I need to really pull this up, bear with me. Uh, essentially, like one of my favorite elements about it is that you have the actor who played Kano in Paul W.S. Anderson's Mortal Kombat, which I'm trying to find his name. He's no longer with us, which is, oh, very sad. Let me get in here. As you hear the keys type, oh, I should have been better prepared as always. All right. So, Men of War, 1994. Uh, this is currently available on Freebie. I know about that. It was very confusing trying to get this to play on my Amazon Prime since I've purchased this one. And then it's like, oh, well, we'll just send you right to Freebie. No, I don't want any commercials. Thank you. So you have, let's see, his name was... Trevor Goddard. Yes, he played Kano in Mortal Kombat. He's an antagonist to Hulk Hogan in Assault on Devil's Island, the TV movie that was highly rated just because of the Sting Hogan Sarcade 97 contract signing. But it's got a lot of, just a lot of people I like. Um, Kevin Teague from uh, Roadhouse and uh, My Bloody Valentine 3D. Uh, Tiny Lister, Zeus uh, from No Holds Barred, if you didn't need... Oh, he's even listed on the feature as uh, Tiny Zeus Lister. May he rest in peace, WWE Hall of Fame, what's the problem there? A BD Wong is kind of a badass in this one, so a lot of fun to be had with this movie. It's not well directed. I mean, that's the biggest thing you can... Um, biggest knock against it, but... Otherwise, I think it's a very solid John Sayles assisted script. He's the uh, gets the top credit for the uh, writer. He's done Eight Men Out, done a lot of genre features. So, a lot of love from the '80s. Listen to the podcast '80s all over if you need any further proof of that. It's the story of Dolph Lundgren trying to walk away from being a mercenary, but uh, his there's a couple of yuppies trying to make some money and they just need an island in the South China Sea cleared out so they head to Chicago which again another cheap pop for me to recruit Dolph Lundgren Nick Gunner the Swede as they know call him a lot of good jokes about the Swedish bit um to form a team to go and uh convince the locals to you know, just sign away their island or else. As I say, the direction is really shoddy. I think a lot of it could have been um, some stock footage when it comes to the explosions. Uh, this was a indie movie. At, at any Well, kind of an indie movie, at least when I wikied the production company. So, um, so besides for the just the flaws in some of the action and the direction, though, the one-liners, like, this is what... Like, this is um, Vernon Wells Bennett uh, uh, from C uh, Commando on steroids, essentially. At least when it comes to the attitude of Trevor Goddard, he's got some just some great lines. Like, I mean, it's there's great fight scene and not really a fight scene. Like, it's it does some clever stuff and it just definitely needs a better hand behind the camera. Um. I mean, in other production qualities, the scores kind of sucks. Um, but this is probably the best you're going to get from uh, Tiny Lister. I will say that much. At least the most dialogue I think he's ever gotten. And um, as I say, Kevin Teague's kind of swami, but kind of likable in this. So the actors, the the actors are perfectly cast, and they just do what they they are told to do. Um, what we wanted to do which I think is half of making a good action movie. The action is the other half, but you get those one-liners, you get the um you get behind our protagonist who's just struggling with the fact does he want to go and obliterate people for money? I think you're going to have a good time. The radiated host cells have entered stage 5 mutation. A genetic experiment. There was never supposed to be a full transformation. Has unlocked the darkest side of humanity. The level of transformation is perfect. You're a liar! And unleashed an evil we never expected. Now, 
Black Mask is here. The most powerful warrior on Earth. He has decided to use his powers for the good of others. Must find the cure. Bring him back to me. Alive. Before he crosses over. Stylist, director Choi Hawk. Terminal mutation in 44 hours and 7 minutes. You'll mind. I am not a monster. I may have just concluded watching the most dumbfounding action feature I've ever seen. It is Black Mask 2 City of Masks. The best thing out of it is John Polito's attempt to be Paul Heyman for a moment. A few moments. So that's a that's a highlight. There's a lot of things I'd like to say are highlights about this movie. The Rob Van Dam isn't bad in it. The entire concept of mutant pro wrestlers are female protagonists who literally can't touch men because of a traumatic experience as a healthcare professional it's just so many crazy things tobin bell is a villain a very early scott atkins performance we're talking before unleashed with jet lee i mean there's just so much i would really want to like this movie and perhaps if i was super high I could get into it, but it's just so insulting that this feature was directed by Xui because he's a guy who got kind of put Jet Li on the map with the uh, Once Upon a Time in China movies. And it's Yuan Wuping uh, choreography, but it's all computers. I mean, it's like they decided, well, if they could shoot Star Wars with all green screens or blue screens what have you we can do an action movie like this and only use one set i really would love to see what the budget on this feature was uh there's no real practical effects at all in this feature um i guess you would say there's some makeup job moments as our professional wrestlers are transforming into monsters but beyond that it's the action is just laughable. You just really, you're just fat, dumbfounded and fascinated that this movie is trying to be something. The only person who can understand this movie, I think, is uh, Hark. Maybe the screenwriters? So this is the English language sequel, The Blast, Black Mask, the Jet Li um, quick release after lethal weapon for it's a story about the black mask initially being hunted down by dr lang played by scott adkins basically black mask wants to get rid of all his super soldier stuff so he's looking for genetic specialists who the antagonist kills before he can get to he finds one in the town which has this huge super world championship wrestling i don't think they use federation but it's a dome, i.e. Tokyo Dome, trying to appeal to so many audiences. I mean, there's scenes in Japanese in this feature. We find out that another evil scientist, played by Tobin Bell, a.k.a. Jigsaw, uh, Moloch is his name in this one, kind of appropriate. He's trying to pr- create the next stage of evolution by mutating people with animals. And he's using a professional wrestling federation as his testing ground. After Black Mass saves a kid from a wrestler who turns into a killer iguana man, the John Polito character, who, as I said, tries his best to be Paul Heyman, and, you know, I'm going to give it to him on that one, decides, well, I'll just have a Black Mask wrestler. It doesn't have to be the Black Mask. So, you know, a little bit offended, a little bit 
what have you. It's just... And then eventually, like, we go back and bring in our more evil villain, uh, Lang, who's trying to recapture the Black Mask for all the genetic experience. You really don't need to see the first movie to get this. So the first Black Mask, the viol- the direction is what makes it very tough to watch, just all the frequent cuts. But at least you get some action in there. This one is the same kind of cuts, and everything's just very synthetic and fake. Again, there's stuff I wanted to try liking about this movie, so I'm not totally insulted by it. Like, um, you know, Bull's Blood Rain, or, you know, everything else I've given a half star to. I mean, this is no Food Fighter Freddy Got Fingered. This is far superior than that, but... I just um, mean there's nothing real about this movie. Oh, I didn't. I don't think I even brought up Tracy Lords as a female wrestler who's the chameleon, and she's losing her ability to stay solid because she just camouflages everything, and she's out for vengeance against the Black Mask for killing the the iguana. It's just so so silly but i love tobin bell in it it's great to see pre jigsaw this is 2002 uh saw would be the next year Uh, i mean john polito tracy lord's trying i mean this is well one one of her more convincing acting performances all things considered and scott adkins actually just who looks like a skinny dr burobotnik dr eggman i this is just i i think I'm not going to say don't watch it. <laughs> don't pay $13 for it. I will say that. I think that's what's going for on iTunes right now. I'm just really flabbergasted. It's just inconceivable that you could create something so stupid, but you still want to like it. Yeah, I'm going to have to stop myself before I start making real offensive stuff. Like Speaking of pro wrestling, this is what? The Eugene character is as a movie. There we go. I said it. Black Mask 2, City of Mask, is Eugene the Wrestler. Hold on to your butts. So the two previous movies in this marathon I'm running, they can both be found on streaming. I believe Freebie offers Men of War. I actually, as I said, owned a copy on Amazon Prime. And it'll cost you... 13 bucks, but you can see Black Mask 2. So, A, just consider that price of admission, I guess. As for the next feature, you can't find it digitally in its original form, but you can find it on Pluto TV with the Riff Tracks commentary. So, a guaranteed good time one way or the other. The Brotherhood. They're an underworld on wheels. They answer to no law. They live by one rule. God forgives. The brotherhood doesn't. There's only one man tough enough and crazy enough to take them on. You just picked up the wrong passenger, buddy. He's an undercover cop doing a good job with a bad attitude. You're on the wrong side of the law. He'll leave you stone cold. Brian Bosworth. He's the outsider on the inside. He's turning up the heat. He'll burn you. Stone cold. I have finally watched Stone Cold in its entirety. This is a film I saw back on cable decades ago, probably by now. And really all I saw was the final act of the feature, which is just insane. A biker group assault on the state courthouse of Mississippi, led by Lance Henriksen, and his only adversary that could stop him is former NFL 
college legend Brian Bosworth. It's got some great set pieces. It might do the supermarket scene better than Cobra did. And as I say, how can you resist the craziness of a biker gang trying to hold the state hostage? It's just so silly. There's some nice nice chase scene with William Forsyth as the biker who doesn't trust the definitely undercover cop that Lance Hendersicken, the leader of the Brotherhood biker gang, just can't smell out. It's just a whole lot of silly. It's what 80s movies. So this is 1991, so this is probably why it bombed. This is a ode to the 80s formula with somebody who just isn't meant to act, I suppose. And you could say, well, Stallone's not really that much of an actor, nor is Schwarzenegger. By the end, it really was just, oh, geez, Bruce Willis, who made things look believable. And, of course, you know, Steven Seagal. There's a great Rewatchables podcast episode on the Ringer Network about Under Siege, which further explains this, but perhaps suggests that, no, action movie stars are just guys we should pick out of the whatever tough man sport they're from or background and put them into films. Brian Bosworth isn't really that charismatic charismatic to pull it off is the only issue here. But as I say, it's a load of silliness. It's kind of flat, though. When it's flat, it is very flat. Lance Hendrickson is the reason to watch this movie. He turns it on throughout all of his scenes. You know, when you think of films like this and Hard hard Target, it's probably going to be worth a watch. I'm not saying it's a classic by any stretch of the imagination. The Blu-ray edition that I got from Olive Films, I believe, does not even have a subtitle track. But the transfer is excellent to HD, so I will give them that much credit. No special features, so I may have overpaid for this used DVD, uh, Blu-ray, I should say. The experiment, I think, was worth it. There's some just great one-liner dialogue in there. I mean, I was just sold on this is going to be a classic in my mind, regardless of the quality with Henriksen's. This reminds me of my father's last words joke. So this is just a good 80s silliness, great background noise. As I say, just such ridiculousness when you eventually get biker gangs, have access to army helicopters. It's just so much craziness that it's unbelievable which again you just have to shut your brain down for this one it once you do that i think you're gonna have a ball the action sequences are there's again some solid action sequences some of the direction could have been better like you know when you have motorcycles cycles flying into um, helicopters yeah that could have been shot a bit better and other elements, I think, like the Al Powell moment at the end of this feature as well. So it hits all the keynotes. It's just Stone Cold's biggest problem is it's just been done all before. But, hey, we're always looking for a new twist now, aren't we? We save lives every day. Strangers. And there's always enough time. I failed to save Jason from this life. Joker got a hold of stolen uranium. He's selling it to terrorists. He's going to take Batman and Robin together to close this case. You take them down while I investigate that warehouse we tracked Joker to. Please tell the big man I said hello. Knowledge of my tactics, my history. This was getting personal. Joker showed me the truth. Evil can't be cured, only killed. Burn in hell, I do 
two fates. Red Robin awaits a verdict. Life or death. Because of my choice, I had to avoid repeating mistakes. So I think I've finally discovered or figured out, I should say, the ideal midnight picture if I was going to do an action movie quadruple free feature, or dare I say, I could expand this. I could do a 24-hour marathon, I think, give me a little more time, but I digress. I rewatched Batman Death in a Family, and fortunately I made two different decisions which gave me two different endings so i've seen three of the seven so it's an interactive blu-ray based around the dc comic batman death in the family where people wrote in and voted for jason todd the second robin to be killed by the joker yeah people okay so Neither, what I'm saying is basically, if you're going to close out a marathon of movies where, well, I think that's great, Riff Tracks has fun with it, what the hell is this? You're going to need something that everybody can get involved with. So this would be my ideal midnight action movie feature, I suppose. So you get over the animated bit, I think we have gold. Now, I'm not saying it's great by any stretch of the imagination. Well, scratch that i think it's great i'm not going to question that if you're offended that mark hamill did not return to be the joker in batman under the red hood i think this is a nice way to wash that out of your mouth yes i know the voice of bender is not quite the joker i would want i suppose and i think alan tudyk on the harley quinn show does a great job kind of finding a nice homage yet hey it's alan tudyk so it's got to be awesome so it's the tale of batman basically trying to save jason todd from a bomb after the joker has beaten him half to death and you get three decisions which is supposed to lead to seven endings so i've chose all three of those decisions and only one of them led to a more complicated plot line. I don't want to give it away, but who knows? Perhaps if I do show this somehow as a midnight feature, I'll just try my best to point people in the right direction. The animation is pretty solid, but you can tell, like, well, this is a way of not spending all our money on making a new title. But if you like the Batman the Animated series style, I really like how they make the Joker seem more evolved and sinister. So I guess that kind of makes up for not having Mark Hamill. But I digress. It's definitely probably less offensive than the Killing Joke. Like, I don't know how, why people were so upset about Batgirl and Batman shipping for a moment. Just a moment. So, yeah, I had a lot of fun just doing this rewatch. And the time it took me to get the a true ending, I suppose, of the seven, I was able to watch two conclusions. But I love what they introduce. I mean, we've got one with Superman. We've got one with Cheetah. It's a lot of fun, I think, to just keep playing around with this. So perhaps you have two features at midnight. So I would definitely not buy this on digital. And oh gosh, that's very sad now that one of the biggest physical retailers is getting out of that game. So A, I guess I am promoting the exorbitant prices we are soon to pay on eBay for this title. But if you can get your hands on a copy, I would definitely recommend Batman Death in the Family. It's got that Batman the Enemy series style that we all love. And, you know, it's fun, especially after you've had a couple of cocktails. We've had a doozy of a day. A real doozy. Thanks for sticking around till this part of the podcast. I usually like to just end it with 
David Tennant's uh, Crowley saying, you know, can I get a woohoo? But I don't want to waste the time that I spent watching Android Apocalypse, a feature where Chris Jericho is third build. I watched all of Chris Jericho's sub 100 minute movies to prep for a podcast that was going to center around McGruber with uh, Tim Loss. Yeah, he no showed that podcast. But if you want to listen to a good one, we did one about the movie Roadside Profits. So that will eventually get back into this main feed. Uh, with all that said, when it comes to Chris Jericho, I'm pretty sure, and this is still all alleged, he's a lech and an adulterist. I uh, can't say anything beyond that. Just that he definitely ruins somebody's life intended or not. You know, he could have just been an asshole, maybe not a creep, at least in that uh, situation, which, of course, NDDA protects. Well, with that said, I don't want to just let all these movies go to waste. So here's a review for Android Apocalypse. Thanks for listening to the 90 for Chill, the podcast. And I'll try to limit the Jericho stuff to at least only once a month. There's only two other movies. So just bear with me and thanks. a made-for sci-fi channel movie. I didn't realize those went all the way to 2006 before The Asylum just took over. Definitely TV production values, and if anything, it tells me that I never really want to visit uh, Saskatchewan in Canada. I didn't think there was really any kind of desolate wasteland in Canada that wasn't covered with snow. This film proves me wrong. It's a um, kind of a slog. There's action, but it's so poorly choreographed, it just barely registers with you and once you get rid of Chris Jericho it's kind of lost all interest to me sorry Joey Lawrence so the film's about Scott Barristow and uh, Joey Lawrence's relationship Joseph Lawrence according to the bill on this pardon basically oh geez I'm sorry I can't come up with the names but your typical two guys stuck together one's an android who's destined to be repaired quote unquote and uh, one is a convicted android murderer so it's okay to kill people as long as they don't serve a purpose to society i guess is the lesson in the future as they're trying to run away from the authorities tethered to each other the android wanted to be human the human just wanted to go on with his life, as you say, being chased down by the prison that they're supposed to be sent to, and actually serve as specimens in an attempt to replace all humanity with androids. It's actually probably good background noise. I mean, it was a made for sci-fi channel movie, so I can't say that it's too painful, except, well, then you just think about everything that's made for TV movies in the uh, Nazis and the 90s were and you get flashbacks. Don't recommend looking for this title, regardless if you're a Chris Jericho completist. If it's on accidentally, hey, 
it's not gonna be too bad. As I say, just don't go looking for it. That way, it might just be a surprise little treasure for you. That's how Dolph Lundgren's Men of War ended up with me. Can I hear a wahoo?